Hey, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started here. We want to thank everyone who um, who is attending, uh, who tuned in tonight. I see um, Winnipeg Architecture. That uh, sounds like it's from a long way away, but thanks for tuning in. And to everyone else, uh, we're delighted uh, to present uh, as our latest lecture in our series presented by the Albert Kahn Legacy Foundation, uh, author Jeff Morrison, author of the book, Guardians of Detroit, Architectural Sculpture in the Motor City. I'll say more about Jeff in just a moment, but first a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, things to take care of. Um, if you've attended our lectures before, this is the fourth in our series. You know that the Albert Kahn Legacy Foundation is a relatively new 501c3 in Detroit, uh, founded last year, uh, whose mission is to honor the work and legacy of Detroit's greatest architect, Albert Kahn. Uh, we do lecture series, we uh, did a bike tour, we're planning for walking tours next year, and we're now in the planning stages for a major exhibit of Albert Kahn and his, and his work at the Detroit, Detroit Historical Museum uh, for next spring. Um, so a lot to look forward to. We hope you stay in touch with us through the website albertkahnlegacy.org. Uh, my name is John Gallagher. I'm formerly with the Detroit Free Press, uh, written several architecture books, uh, about the city, and I'm delighted to be your host and MC this evening. Two, uh, two housekeeping things. Um, first, um, at, to support the work of the foundation, the foundation is now um, running a silent auction. Uh, if you visit our website, albertconlegacy.org, you can see all the many items we have uh, up for bid, uh, including um, books, memorabilia, um, prints, uh, photos, walking tours of um, Albert Kahn buildings, uh, a sailboat ride on Lake St. Clair, um, even uh, dinner with uh, Peter, Peter Robertson, one of our board members who is Albert Kahn's great grandson and uh, myself. So um, visit the website, uh, place a bid. The silent auction is open until tomorrow evening at eight o'clock. I'm sure if you visit, you'll find something there to uh, uh, please your fancy. Uh, secondly, if you notice at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that says Q&A. Uh, we'd like you to put any questions you have there. Click that and put your questions in there, and then we'll get to as many as we can at the conclusion of Jeff's main presentation. So please do not use the raise hand uh, icon. Please use the Q&A instead. Well, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Jeff Morrison, uh, historian and photographer, um, the author of the book Guardians of Detroit, uh, architectural Sculpture in the Motor City, published by Wayne State University Press, and the winner of multiple awards, including a Michigan Notable Book Award, last, awarded last year by the Library of Michigan. Uh, Jeff is an historian and photographer. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in history and art from Eastern Michigan, and over 30 years experience as a graphic artist. Uh, he uh, lives in Oxford uh, with his wife, Susie, uh, and his passions include both architecture, photography, and exploring uh, the city he has come to love. Uh, so uh, Jeff, uh, please take it away. Uh, he'll speak for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll uh, take some questions. So Jeff, over to you. Uh, great. Hi, John. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Albert Kahn Legacy Foundation for having me here today. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight. As John said, I'm Jeff Morrison, and I'm here to talk about architectural sculpture on some buildings designed by Albert Kahn and show pictures of that sculpture, uh, many of which are from my book, Guardians of Detroit. And some are from my forthcoming book, Guardians of Michigan, Architectural Sculpture of the Pleasant Peninsulas. So Albert Kahn designed many buildings around the world uh, especially factories, office buildings, university buildings. It's well remembered in Detroit for the Packard plant, the Ford uh, factory complex in Highland Park, the Ford Rouge complex, um, and two of the most iconic Detroit buildings, the General Motors World Headquarters and the Fisher Building. And I'm not going to talk about any of those buildings tonight. I'm actually going to talk about eight very specialized buildings. And I'm going to share my screen to start my presentation. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, 
make sure I have this right. There we go. And here we have it. So uh, just a quick reminder, the um, Guardians of Detroit website, guardiansofdetroit.com, if you want to find out more about the book. Uh, the book is also for sale off that website. And if you have any questions that don't get answered tonight or any other questions that you may think of or want to contact me for some reason, you can do so at guardiansofdetroit at gmail.com. So we're going to look at eight very specialized buildings, and those buildings are all newspaper buildings. Uh, these buildings were all designed and built between 1917 and 1936, and all but one are still standing today. Uh, but oddly enough, none of them, uh, they're all still in use, but none of them are used as newspaper buildings. So we'll start with three big city newspaper buildings built in Detroit and move on to newspaper buildings from five smaller cities. So the first one we're going to look at is the Detroit News Building built in 1917. It's at 615 West Lafayette Boulevard in Detroit. The sculptor for the building uh, is Joachim Junger. Well, at least the, the exterior work is attributed to him. It's known that he did the wood carving on the inside and he was mainly a wood carver, but he did do uh, exterior and stones. Um, Herbert Gate is one of the things that he worked on, the old Herbert Gate. Uh, it used to be the entrance to Waterworks Park when it was still there. Uh, the giant stove that used to stand outside of the state fairgrounds is his work, as well as the uh, large wooden figures on the facade of the Brass Rail Restaurant, which are now on the front of the Cruisin' Muir downtown Rochester restaurant. He was also the father of Leonard Youngworth, who uh, sculpted the Gabriel Richard statue in downtown Detroit, as well as the Spartan at MSU. So you can see up along the top of the building, there are four figures up there with some writing in between them. So let's start by taking a look at those four figures. Uh, the first figure is, uh, you know, they're all printing pioneers of some sort, historical printers. First one on the left is Johannes, Johannes Gutenberg, uh, first to European use of movable type. Uh, next is William Caxton, who brought the printing press to England and uh, printed the first books that were printed in England. And after him is Christoph Planton, who is most well known for publishing the Polyglot Bible, which was a, a Bible in uh, multiple different languages, each language side by side in columns. And then, uh, of course, Benjamin Franklin, the uh, colonial American printer and founding father. And I, I did a little bit more of a close up on him so you can see uh, the other figures are pretty well preserved, have last, held up pretty well uh, to the elements over the last hundred years. But the uh, statue of Ben Franklin is beginning to get a bit worn down. Now, in between these figures, as you could see in the previous picture, is a uh, series of texts. These were all statements of what um, uh, George Goff Booth believed the role of the newspaper should be. Uh, some of those examples are uh, mirror of the public mind, interpreter of the public intent, troubler of the public conscience, bearer of intelligence, dispeller of ignorance and prejudice, a light shining into all dark places. Um, Booth, Mr. Booth was very much involved in the design of this building. He was somewhat of a, a talented amateur architect and worked very closely with Albert Kahn in bringing this building to life. Uh, there's also a series of these um, cryptic symbols on the outside of the building. And what they are is printer's marks of historic printers. Uh, basically, they're early logos of the different printers. Uh, in the top row, starting on the left, we have the printer's mark of Christopher Froshover. Now, Froshover translates as Frogover, as you might guess when you look at the, the shield, look at the picture in the middle and the um, figure riding on the frog there in the middle. And then the two frogs on either side 
represent his sons who also worked with him in the business. And then in the middle is the, um, oh, Froshover was the publisher of the first English, English language Bible printed on the European continent. Then in the middle is the printer's mark of Aldous Minutius, who created italic type and pocket-sized books, making um, knowledge more portable. And you see there, it's a, a dolphin wrapped around an anchor, and that represents his motto, which was to make haste slowly. And then on the far right, we have the printer's mark of Albert Poffred, the first publisher of Luther's 95 Theses. And then across the bottom are um, the printer's marks of John Sibirk, Philip Pigochet, uh, Jay Bazikin, and John Biddle. So the Detroit News, um, well, let's, let's move on one more picture. We have these cartouches at the corners of the building. They're on all four corners of the building on both sides of the corner. And you can see the owl in the center on top of the shield representing knowledge. And then in the, on the shield itself is the American Eagle holding a newspaper in its claws, representing the First Amendment and freedom of the press. So the, the Detroit News, let me go back a second. Detroit News stayed in this building until uh, 2013. It was bought by Dan Gilbert and Bedrock Real Estate in 2014. And the interior was totally remodeled and redone. Some of it was restored. The exterior was restored and cleaned. And um, it's now the home mostly to Quicken Loans. Molina Health had some offices there for a while, but I believe they have moved out and it's all uh, Quicken Loans and uh, maybe some other of uh, Dan Gilbert's businesses there now. So we're gonna move on next to the Detroit Free Press building, which is just down the road from the Detroit News building at 321 West Lafayette, it was built in 1925. And uh, of course the architect is Albert Kahn and the sculptor was Ulysses A. Ritchie, probably with the, the assistance of a man named Corrado Parducci, who was at one time his apprentice and worked with him at a, a studio they both worked at later on. Uh, Ritchie was born in New York City in 1888 his parents came there from Tuscany, and he believed himself descended from a family that had made uh, pottery and sculpture for many generations. He started sculpting in clay when he was six years old. He was accepted at the Drexel Institute on the basis of his work when he was 11, and then asked to leave when it was found out how young he was. Uh, he apprenticed with his uncle, Alessio Ricci, who was the modeling supervisor at Perth Amboy Terracotta Works, in New Jersey. <clears throat> and uh, then he, he worked with Anthony DiLorenzo and Sons, partnered with them, uh, DiLorenzo and Company, and then eventually opened his own New York City studio. And his work is on many uh, con building commissions in Michigan, in Detroit, and around the Detroit area, and also uh, around New York City and Washington, DC. So you can see up at the top of the tower, there's a sentinel figure. There's several of those on the outside of the building. Here's a, a closer look. Uh, the Sentinel with two gargoyles, flanked by gargoyles on either side. And then there's also a series of medallions representing historic figures and newspaper men and, and um, important figures of the day. At the, the left here is another image of Benjamin Franklin. And then you have Charles Dana, who was a, a journalist. And uh, James, Angel, uh, president of the University of Michigan, and then of course, General Custer, and there are others as well. And one of the things I like about these images is when you look, you can zoom in real close on Ben Franklin, and I love the, the way the eyes are finished, the kind of bizarre curly cue in the eyes. And then uh, there's also a series of medallions representing um, various modes of transportation, as you can see there on the bottom row. Uh, also, on either side of the door, there's a couple of guardian figures. The one on the left represents commerce. Uh, one of the ways we could tell this is if you look in her right hand on her staff, it's uh, got the two snakes curling around it. That would be a type of caduceus. <clears throat> the caduceus was the 
staff of Mercury, the Roman messenger god, who is also the Roman god of commerce. So that's how we know she represents commerce. And it's American commerce because she has the eagle there at her feet. And then on the other side is uh, communications. Uh, she holds the torch of knowledge. She has an owl representing knowledge at her feet. And then she also holds uh, the broken chains of ignorance in her left hand. Now also around the entrance, we have several other decorations. Uh, in the top row here, we see a couple of uh, figures, uh, reliefs uh, representing the authority of knowledge on the left. And then in the middle is one representing modern communications. And then there's also some symbolic imagery around there. The upper right is a seahorse. And if you're like me, you're wondering what's a, a seahorse doing on a newspaper building. And it represents uh, good fortune. And then the, the bottom picture is a little closer look at the pedestal the two goddesses of commerce and communication stand on. Uh, there in the middle is a man with a printing press. Um, just going back one more time to the Free Press building. Uh, this is another building that was bought by Dan Gilbert and his Bedrock Real Estate, bought in 2016. It had stood empty for many years. Uh, he re renovated it, cleaned up the outside, uh, remodeled the inside and reopened it. Uh, it reopened in November of 2020 as the Press 321 has 105 apartment units inside. Uh, it's also going to have uh, first floor retail and two floors of office space are planned for it as well. And now we're looking at a building that is no longer there in downtown Detroit. Uh, the Detroit Times building, which was built in 1929. It's at, uh, it was at 1370 Cass Avenue. And um, the sculpture on this building was also done go up by Corrado Parducci. Uh, well, actually the first one that was done uh, completely by Corrado Parducci, at least as far as we know. Uh, this newspaper was first published. It's kind of uh, Detroit's forgotten newspaper. Uh, it was the third great newspaper at one time. It was first published in 1900, uh, purchased in 1921 by William Randolph Hearst, who um, at the time he bought it, the circulation was 26,000 readers. Uh, and that grew in the space of one year to over 150,000 readers. So he needed a bigger building. And he commissioned Khan to design this beautiful Art Deco newspaper palace. It was uh, entirely uh, for newspaper work, like the Detroit News Building, the Detroit Free Press Building that we just looked at. Um, the newspaper uh, operated on the second and third floors with the mailing room at the back and commercial retail at the front. And uh, the rest of this, most of the rest of the space was income generating office space. This building was exclusively for the production of newspapers. So um, around about 1960, their readership declined. And uh, all the, in 1960, all the, the newspaper and all its assets were bought by the Detroit News. All the employees were released, the newspaper was shut down, and the news used this building as an auxiliary printing site or an extra printing site. They didn't use the offices at all, just the, the printing plant on the, the lower floors. And um, that ended when they opened their Sterling Heights facility in 1973. Um, so the rest of the building had been unused. It started to deteriorate. The building stood empty for a while and deteriorated, deteriorated even further. Uh, they tried to sell it, but couldn't find a buyer. And it was uh, finally demolished in 1978. So um, we do have at least one piece of sculpture it was known to have been saved from this building. This is an owl that was uh, on the building. It uh, spent some time uh, in the possession of whoever saved it, either in their backyard or their basement or somewhere in their house. And it was eventually donated to the Belle Isle Conservancy who displays it now in the Belle Isle Conservatory, uh, Conservatory, another building designed by Albert Kahn. And the site where the newspaper used to, uh, the building used to stand is now a parking lot. Now, one of the, uh, in, an interesting story about the sculpture on this building, uh, there's a, 
a uh, interview, an oral history history interview with Corrado Parducci, and he talks about making the models for the sculpture for this building. There was a, a series of quite a few different um, figures, uh, babies doing newspaper things, uh, representing, you know, little cherubs, uh, representing different aspects of newspaper work. And he'd done all these models and came, Khan came to his studio and looked at them and said they were too big and asked him to do another set of models uh, that were smaller. And he paid for both sets of models. So, uh, of course, Parducci was happy to do it and he made smaller models. But uh, even though he disagreed with Khan on that subject, and then uh, the plaster models that Parducci produced were used by the stone carvers to make the finished piece. And when those were in place on the building, the uh, Mr. Khan looked at them and decided, you know, they look too small. Uh, Mr. Parducci was right. So he had uh, frames made around them to make them look bigger when they were in place on the building. Now we're going to leave Detroit and move on to Flint, Michigan. Uh, this building here was the home of the Flint Journal, uh, built in 1924. It's at 200 East 1st Street in Flint. And it's a nice example of Kahn's uh, neoclassical style. Um, notice the elaborate cornice on this building has kind of a feel of a, a Italian Renaissance Romanesque palace to it. And you can see uh, the short side of the building facing us uh, when the building was first built, that center bay was where the entrance was. And then the entrance was moved around the side when the building was added on to later on. And you can see there's a lot of ornamentation on the building up uh, under the cornice, uh, on the spandrels between the, the upper windows and then above the lower, the arches on the lower windows. So let's take a closer look at some of that. Um, there's a series of these medallions on the outside of the building. They're all uh, just above those ground floor arched windows. And they all are, for the most part, most of them represent various forms of mass communication or communicating the news to the public. Appropriate subject for a newspaper building here on the left. We have somebody carving uh, hieroglyphics into a wall for the people to read, probably the story of the most recent dynasty. And then on the right is a man setting mov movable type to be put into a printing press. And then here we have a man working on a metal plate, engraving an image into a metal plate for uh, mass production uh, and printing. And then on the right is a woman with a quill pen and a bottle of ink, and she's writing on a parchment. And there's also a couple of allegorical figures. Uh, here on the left is a figure representing um, science or uh, wisdom and education. You can see the owl in the background. He's a, a very deep in thought and holding a book. And then on the right is a figure representing knowledge and science. She holds the, uh, the lamp of knowledge. And then you can see the word science on the building behind her. Um, there's also a series of printer's marks on the outside of the building. Here's 16 of them. And you can see that in a lot of ways, they're very similar and this can make them difficult to identify. I have several different sources for identifying these and I was able to identify all of those. Uh, but yeah, you can see that they're all um, unique, but in many cases similar. Um, the top row is the printer's mark of Hugh Singleton followed by the Gunta, then Andrew Miller, and then uh, Kraft Miller. The second row is John Giacomo de Legnano, followed by the, the printer's mark of Melchior Lauder, uh, Peregrino Pasqualibus, and Jacobus de Plortsheim, uh, Fortsheim, excuse me. And then the third row is Erhard Oglin, Robert Copeland, uh, Jacoby Tanner, and Nicholas de Frandortia, Frank Fordia, excuse me. And then uh, bottom row, Bernardino de Macintis, the uh, commune at Brain, uh, John Scott, and Reinhold Beck. So the Flint Journal uh, left this building in 2012, and it is currently home to the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. 
Now we're moving on from the Flint Journal building to the Kalamazoo uh, Gazette building. Uh, uh, built in 1925, it's at 401 South Burdick Street in Kalamazoo. And the sculptor again is Corrado Parducci. Uh, you can see um, still has some of those Romanesque elements, but it's much, uh, or at least classical elements, but it's a, a bit more simplified. You don't have that elaborate cornice. Uh, you have the, the figures there on the, the facade up above, and then uh, several different types of ornamentation on the rest of the building. And this is another building that on this uh, short side of the building, that center bay at ground level is where the original door was. So this newspaper was founded in uh, late 1832, early 1833, as the Statesman and St. Joseph Chronicle. And it was founded in White Pigeon, Michigan. And the name changed to Michigan Statement, the Michigan Statesman when it was moved to Bronson. And then the name changed again to the Kalamazoo Gazette after Bronson was renamed Kalamazoo. And it is the oldest continuously operating newspaper in Michigan outside of Detroit. In 1922, it became the eighth publication in the Booth Publishing Company chain. The uh, Flint Journal was purchased by George Goff Booth uh, as one of the first newspapers in that chain. So all, all of the buildings that we're going to look at from here on out were part of the Booth publishing chain. And um, one of the things that Goff would do, Booth would do is uh, hire Khan to build a state-of-the-art newspaper building for each of his newspapers in each of his cities. Um, let's take a closer look at these two figures. The one on the left is holding a quill pen and a book represents um, recorded history or recorded knowledge. And the one on the right holds an hourglass and represents the passage of time. And then in between them is this figure of an owl fighting with a snake. And it represents the triumph of knowledge, the owl, over the treachery of ignorance, the snake. And this is the first of a kind of unique series of animal-based allegories of different uh, newspaper functions and principles. You saw in the, the Flint building, they were all human figure-based allegories. Now we have animal-based ones. So here we have a wolverine uh, with a, um, uh, it's been out hunting and captured something. The wolverine, of course, represents the state of Michigan, as well as its abundance of natural resources, and uh, also symbolizes the, the, uh, it's a reminder of the newspaper's obligation to help safeguard, safeguard those natural resources. Uh, here we have a beaver holding a cog representing industry and the, the beehive in the background represents industrious hard work. We have a lion with uh, the lamp of knowledge in the background representing the newspaper's obligation to be a protector of knowledge and presenter of knowledge. Uh, here we have a squirrel with a cornucopia full of nuts, a reminder to store uh, away for bad times, even during good times, because good times will not always last. Uh, now we have a kind of uh, angry or evil looking wolf in front of a caduceus. And we know from the Free Press building that the caduceus is a symbol of commerce. So this is a reminder of the newspaper's row, uh, role, um, well, a reminder to beware of the avarice of business and the newspaper's role to expose uh, shady business dealings or uh, un unjust business dealings by unscrupulous businessmen, be a watchdog for the community. Uh, here's a, a pretty obvious one with the uh, hourglass, the winged hourglass, representing how time flies by quickly. And then the rabbit represents the newspaper's ability to respond quickly and report the news as it, even as it happens. And then the cat with the mouse, it's a little more subtle reminder of the newspaper's role of finding hidden problems 
and exposing them to the public view. Um, and then we also have this dog with a uh, cross keys behind it. The cross keys are a typical symbol of St. Peter and the gates of heaven. And the dog is a symbol of loyalty. So taken together, they're a reminder uh, to be loyal to your faith and uh, not as some might think uh, a reminder that all dogs go to heaven. And then there's also at the tops of the piers around the outside of the building, uh, these grotesque faces, uh, symbols that ward off various forms of evil. And there's also uh, on this building some printer's marks, most of which we've already seen, so we're not going to take much of a look at them. Um, Bronson Healthcare Group recently purchased this building, uh, tore down additions that were added on in 1968 and 2004, but they're keeping and restoring the two oldest and most historically significant portions of the building. And um, it's all going to be used for uh, to house offices and laboratory facilities. Now we're going to move on to Jackson and the building that was erected for the Jackson Citizen Patriot newspaper in 1927. It's at 214 South Jackson Street in Jackson. And the sculptor again is Corrado Carducci. We're gonna hear that name a lot tonight, we have already. And we can see that, um, again, it's that neoclassical design, but uh, in some ways a little more simplified. No capitals for the pillars, again, no elaborate cornice, but there is a, a little bit more ornamentation and it kind of combines the styles of ornamentation from the Free Press building, the figures from, uh, like we're used on the Free Press building in the Kalamazoo Gazette, and then the circular medallion figures that were used on the Flint Journal, as well as the statements of intent from the old Detroit News Building. Uh, those statements, we'll start with those first, um, are quotes from various people. The first one is a quote from Woodrow Wilson, he who molds public opinion goes deeper than he who enacts statutes. In the center is with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right from Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address. And then on the right is as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country from the biblical book of Proverbs. And you can see there's also a very large interesting cartouche there in the middle above the doorway. So let's start by taking a closer look at that. Uh, it represents uh, Michigan, the shield there, the symbol Great Seal of Michigan, surrounded by uh, owls representing knowledge and some guardian grotesque figures. And um, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the Jackson Citizen Patriot. Uh, notice the name, it's the Citizen Patriot. This paper was founded in 1837 as the Jacksonburg Sentinel. And papers that time did not make any pretense at impartiality, they functioned as mouthpieces for political parties. The Sentinel backed the Whigs and later the Republicans, and it was opposed by the Michigan Democrat, which later became the Jackson Patriot. Both of these papers were bought in 1918 by Booth Publishing Company and merged as the Jackson Citizen Patriot. And the editor proclaimed at that time today, there are neither Republicans or Democrats. We are either patriotic citizens or enemies of America. It is with this thought that the citizen patriot faces the future, uh, the future being uh, today, uh, eventually. So this was also uh, an illustration of Booth's strategy when he moved into a city. One of his strategies was to eliminate competition. He would buy two or more competing newspapers, close the weakest, merge the strongest, and it was his belief that this is what was best for the community, kind of a paternalistic belief because it, it reduced contention in the community. It provided better value to advertisers. And incidentally, it also reduced his operating expenses. So uh, since he was the publisher and could be counted on to be fair and impartial, uh, everything should work out just fine, at least as, as far as he uh, believed. Um, one of the interesting 
features on, or two of the interesting features on this building are these Egyptian figures uh, at either end of the building. And they are a reflection of the country's passion for everything Egyptian following the discovery of King Tut's tomb by the explorer and archeologist Howard Carter in 1922. And that inspired a sort of nationwide mania for ancient Egyptian themed stuff. Uh, Khan and Parducci found a way to make the, this pop culture fascination with Egyptian things uh, uh, represent relevant to a, a modern newspaper by uh, having the figure on the left. Uh, you can see he's holding uh, a jar and a pestle for grinding pigment that he is then going to provide to the figure on the right that is using a pen to write on a scroll uh, to disseminate news to the public. Now, as I mentioned, we also have these circular figures on the building. These, uh, this one here is using an old style printing press. And the one on the right is setting type. If you look close, you can see that the type says citizen, uh, you can read the words, the letter CIT, it's reversed because when you press it onto the paper, then it comes out right. Um, this building, uh, like all the others, is still in use and like all the others is no longer a newspaper building, no longer used for newspaper production. It is now called the Albert Kahn Apartments. Now we move on to the city of Muskegon and the home of the Muskegon Chronicle which was built in 1928. It's at 981 Third Street in Muskegon. The sculptor again is Corrado Parducci. And the uh, Muskegon Chronicle became part of George Booth's newspaper chain in 1914, one of the earliest papers acquired for the chain. Uh, but the new building wasn't erected until 1928. And as you can see, it follows the trend of even more uh, simplified or modernized, ver modernized version of European architectural styles. Uh, in this case, there are no figures on the building, uh, no ornamental cornice, really just that straight edge. Uh, the, the piers are kind of uh, fluted like pillars and they do have rudimentary capitals at the top. Um, all those circular symbols at the above the second floor windows are just rosettes. And then the uh, symbols and the spandrels between the first and second floor windows are all printer's marks. And here's a look at the nine different printer's marks found on the building. Uh, some of them are repeated because we'll go back to the building here for a second. Uh, it's really hard to tell looking at it, uh, but it was added on to several times. The first time it was added on to in a way that is really hard to discern where the original building ends and the new building begins. And if you look at the, the left side of the building, left wall of the building, the one that's in sunlight, uh, the first four bays were part of the original building and the last two at the far left were part of the addition. And these um, all quite different, quite interesting printer's marks on the building illustrate uh, a problem that you can have when trying to figure out what they all are. I have quite a few resources for finding printer's marks, both online and bound in my personal library. But I had a really difficult time uh, determining the, who belonged, uh, the name of the printer, that the, the uh, printer's mark, the two marks in the center row on the left, uh, the first and second one. Um, turns out they belong to uh, uh, Curonimus Durante of Pavia, and Benedictus Dolcebelli in Capri and Novi. And the reason they were difficult to find was I could find some that were very similar, but none that had the letters MC. And it wasn't until I found a newspaper article uh, actually published by the Muskegon Chronicle that explained the origins of all these symbols that mentioned that the, uh, those two in the middle, the M and C were added in place of other letters to stand for Muskegon Chronicle. So uh, this building is still in use and it is now part of Muskegon Community College and is used as a technology center. 
And now we come to the last newspaper building we're going to look at tonight. This is um, originally the Ann Arbor News Building. Now, as you can see, it's the home of the University of Michigan Credit Union, built in 1936. Uh, 340 East Street in Ann Arbor is where it's located. And once again, the sculptor is Corrado Parducci. So as I said, we've mentioned his name a lot and uh, with good reason, because he did so much work on these buildings. So let's uh, examine his life a little bit. Here's a picture of Mr. Parducci from uh, the Detroit Free Press, a 1931 edition of the uh, Detroit Free Press. Those sculptures in the picture are sculptures of uh, his three sons that he was working on. So Parducci was a small town boy born in Budi, a small Italian village north of Pisa. And in 1904, when he was four years old, he came to New York City with his father, who uh, placed him in an orphanage while he earned money and saved money to bring the rest of the family over a year and a half later, so that by the time the rest of the family came over him, uh, Parducci was sprung from the orphanage. He no longer spoke Italian and he needed to have a translator so he could communicate with his family. Family lived in a very artistic neighborhood. Eugene O'Neill lived just around the corner. The sculptor Daniel French, who created the Abraham Lincoln statue in the Lincoln Memorial, had a studio in the neighborhood. And Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, a socialite sculptor, arts patron, founder of the Whitney Museum of Modern Art, uh, got the names of boys, took it upon herself to get the names of boys with aptitude for the arts and paid for them to um, attend art schools and art classes. He eventually attended the uh, Beaux-Arts School in New York, had a series of apprentices. Uh, among uh, those apprenticeships, one was with Ulysses Ritchie, who we mentioned in connection with a couple of these buildings. Uh, and then uh, he ended up with Anthony De Lorenzo and Company in New York, and this was a company with whom uh, Albert Kahn contracted for with on a regular basis, and uh, he liked Parducci's work so much that he would often specify that Parducci work on his buildings. Kahn brought Parducci here to Detroit in 1925 to supervise sculptural work being done on the First State Bank Building and Security Trust Building, uh, both on Griswold Street in downtown Detroit. Uh, and Parducci, Parducci, who was known for his speed and versatility, uh, was showered with so much work, not just from Kahn, but from George D. Mason and Donaldson and Meyer and Smith, Hinchman and Grills and all the other major, major architectural firms in the city that he um, never left. He stayed in Detroit, sent for his wife, had her come join him. And uh, because of this and because of Kahn bringing him here and all the work he got, just about every building that went up during Detroit's building boom of the uh, mid to late 1920s and on into the 30s had Parducci's work in it or on it at, at, or both. And uh, also a lot of the buildings around uh, the, outside the, the Detroit. So here we are with the Ann Arbor News Building. Uh, you can see, as I said, it's a much more um, Act modern design, more of an Art Deco design. Still has the piers, but they're no longer fluted like pillars. They're stepped back, giving it an uh, Art Deco feel. And then um, you have the spandrels between the first and second floor windows of black granite with the contrasting aluminum uh, reliefs representing different aspects of newspaper publishing. So here we can see a uh, telephone operator, um, somebody representing radio, um, an aviator, um, travel, one representing travel, and then of course photography and printing. So that uh, concludes our tour of Albert Kahn designed newspaper buildings. We've looked at three very distinct big city newspaper buildings and seen the stylistic evolution of five similar small town newspaper buildings. And it's interesting to note uh, what these buildings all have in common. They all, uh, except for two of them, have George Goff Booth as uh, a guiding hand working with Albert Kahn uh, to design these buildings. And most of them have the work 
of Corrado Carducci on them. So uh, I hope you find it as interesting as I do to compare and contrast these buildings and the sculpture on them. So before I, I conclude, I just want to uh, mention um, my forthcoming book again, Guardians of Michigan. It should be coming out uh, next fall, about this time next year. If you have any questions or comments or uh, suggestions for buildings to include in this, it will cover uh, architectural sculpture in the state of Michigan that is not in the city of Detroit. So you can reach me either at guardiansofdetroit.com or guardiansofmichigan.com. Uh, hey, so I'm going to hey. stop sharing now. Well, Jeff, Jeff, Hi. thank you very much. That was an outstanding presentation. And, and uh, I worked in two of these buildings, the news building and the free press building, and I still learned a lot that I, that I didn't know. Uh, we're going to go to questions now. Barb Heller and I have the same question. How did you get such great photos when so many of these sculptures are up high up on the building? Um, I have a 600 millimeter zoom lens. Uh, just about all the photos were taken from ground level using that lens. And um, you can, uh, if you're too close to the building, you get um, a perspective effect where they're narrow at the top and wider at the bottom. But the further back you step from the building, uh, the more you can get them to be squared off. And um, also Photoshop uh, is a wonderful tool. <laughs> Okay, all right, very good. Uh, let's see, um, is there a building that you found uh, particularly surprising or intriguing, uh, either, um, uh, it says either from tonight or from your overall explanation. So any building that really surprised you? Um, I think of these buildings, the, um, when I first started the Detroit, uh, Guardians of Detroit project, I was very aware of the Detroit news building. Uh, but not of the Detroit Free Press building. So um, coming across that, you know, when I first started coming down to Detroit and looking for all these buildings, uh, that was quite a treat to find a building with so much sculpture on it. And then also um, the, the one in Jackson with the Egyptian figures that seemed uh, so out of the ordinary. Right. Uh, Steve Shotwell is asking, um, what do we know about how these sculptures were actually made? Uh, well, what would happen for, uh, for the most part um, on these buildings, the sculptor would make, a, the way Parducci in particular worked, is he would make a, a clay model first, what he called a sketch, and show that to the architect and get a preliminary approval. And then he would typically make a, a full-size plaster model, um, first uh, mold it out of clay and then cast it in plaster. And then the sculptors, uh, sometimes in a, a stone yard or a studio, sometimes actually working on the building, would use uh, Parducci's work as a guideline and carve the um, sculpture in stone. And would they be carved uh, into the building or would, they, would, they be, would these sculptures be attached to the building after they were done? Uh, it depends. I think uh, as years went by, they started being attached to the building as the building was finished. But I know um, when Khan brought Parducci to Detroit to supervise the work on those two bank buildings, um, it was the middle of winter and they had uh, stone carvers up on scaffolding working in the middle of the winter and uh, Khan didn't want to be going up and down the scaffolding. Uh, and um, uh, Parducci was a much younger man. And so uh, he brought him in to supervise that work and spend time going up and down the scaffolding in the middle of winter. Okay. And Amy is asking, how much consultation uh, was there between either Khan or Booth uh, with Parducci and the other sculptors? How much, how much say did they have in what, what was going on in their buildings? Uh, Khan, in general, um, he got to uh, trust Parducci to the point that on some of his plans, uh, he didn't even, he, he would keep the, the ornamentation for himself. You know, he had a big, big organization, a lot of people working on the buildings, and he was the, basically the conductor of the orchestra in many cases, but he liked doing the ornamentation and he would keep a lot of that work for himself. Um, but he would also, um, at one time, uh, architects would spend a lot of time doing very detailed scale drawings of the, the sculpture that was to go on the building. And that changed 
uh, with Khan and the relationship that he had with Parducci. Uh, sometimes he would even just leave a space on the plans and write Parducci on the plan, meaning that he would come up with something after they would talk about it. Hmm. And he would come up with something that they would use on the building. Okay, Melissa is asking, um, did people actually see the sculpture when it was up kind of high? I mean, do, how, how much of an impact do you think it had on passerbys or people who worked in the building? Um, well, you, you know, you can see like on the Detroit News Building, uh, those figures are fairly large, fairly large, so they're easily seen from ground level. But on a building like um, especially the, the Detroit Times, um, the, the images were very small. And so I'm not sure how much people really did notice. Uh, part of that comes from, uh, com you know, it's a combination of European architectural styles with American architectural styles, the, the very American uh, form of the tall building. And the, the European architectural style would call for ornamentation around the cornice in the upper levels. So they were still doing that. Not, sometimes that would be they would go out of their way to make it oversized so that it could be seen from ground level, but in some cases they didn't. So the impact would vary. Yeah, it's interesting that today uh, you no longer get uh, sculpture on a building. You get uh, sculpture in the lobby uh, or perhaps in the plaza outside, but, but this is kind of a lost art, I think, isn't it? Yeah, um, one of the exceptions, the only exception that I've noticed is uh, sports arenas. Like uh, mm. Comerica Park, you have all the Tigers around the outside. Um, the uh, baseball stadium in Toronto has some interesting sculpture on uh, on its exterior and uh, some of the others, they're, they're using it on those type of buildings. But that seems to be the, the only place really. Yeah, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Metzger is asking, it, it's interesting that the human sculptures um, uh, on a lot of the buildings were heavily muscled heroic figures, but on the Ann Arbor News Building, uh, they were almost abstract, Not they don't have that muscular look. Yeah, that, it kind of points up um, Parducci's versatility um, because uh, in the earlier buildings they're using a, a more classical design sense. He would design something that would go with the style of the building. And when you're using a more Romanesque style, it would be a more uh, heroic idealized human form. And then with the Ann Arbor News Building, it's an Art Deco style, and so they're uh, much more sleek and thin and streamlined, like you would see in the Art Deco style. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, Dennis King is asking about uh, Marshall Fredericks. Is he featuring in any of your works, any of your books? Uh, he is indeed in the uh, Guardians of Detroit book. Uh, he did the sculpture on the Horace Rackham building, which mm -hmm. is uh, in the Art Center uh, just south of the Detroit Institute of Arts is a pretty good program of sculpture on the exterior of that building. And um, his work is featured in a, a couple of buildings in the, um, the forthcoming book too, in and around uh, buildings in and around Michigan. Okay. Um, Jim Lewis was asking uh, about the documentary about uh, Parducci that came out, I guess, a couple of years ago. Um, uh, what can you tell us, that, that was not yours, correct? That was not mine, no. Right. Uh, very good documentary, though. I did see it. Mm -hmm. um, they um, showed a lot of uh, Parducci's work and talked a lot um, about uh, Parducci on that. I, I enjoyed it immensely. It's been a while since I've seen it. Yeah, and I believe uh, the uh, uh, person who was involved in that is going to be one of our lecturers later uh, next year. Uh, we oh. have half a dozen more lectures sort of in planning stages here. I've heard. Uh, okay, let's give people a chance to ask another question or two here. Um, but, um, you know, it's funny, it, uh, when you showed eight newspaper buildings, none of which are still used by newspapers anymore. It says something about the newspaper industry, uh, which where I spent my whole career in the newspaper industry. And it's really uh, uh, too bad to see the, you know, newspapers used to have to make a monumental statement uh, with the building. And now the theory is, uh, oh, it's all digital. Uh, you don't want to be tied down to real estate. Uh, you know, it's all it's all online. Uh, you know that sort of philosophy. So, in a way, it's not surprising that uh, all of these uh, uh, buildings are no longer occupied by the people who uh, who built them. But they're they're a, a nice tribute to how uh, Khan built things to last, and the durability of his uh, design and engineering. 
Right. Well, that in fact is is uh, sort of a guiding principle of the Albert Kahn Legacy Foundation. That uh, you know Albert Kahn not only uh, you know built the great factories that he's probably most famous for, but things like the Fisher Building and uh, uh, you know the works on Belle Isle, the aquarium and the conservatory, all of which are you know 100 years old or older, and still some of the most important buildings in Detroit. Um, the other thing that I find fascinating about Albert Kahn is he could really do it all. I mean, he did office buildings, he did houses, he did, you know, um, you know, the aquarium, the conservancy, the conservatory, tall buildings, low rise buildings. Educational buildings at the University of Michigan. Right, exactly. Um, well, I don't see any more questions. So, uh, Jeff, we're just going to thank you uh, for a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. Your photography is beautiful. Um, I, I got to get me one of those 600 millimeter uh, <laughs> lenses so I could do this sort of thing. That, that um, is a very high resolution camera. <laughs> right, right. Well, what, well, just what, what camera do you use? I use a Canon. Uh, um, let's see, uh, I D. I think it's called Mark Three. Okay. And uh, I imagine you have a pretty steady tripod and all the rest of it that you. Uh, I actually shoot handheld. Almost really? All of them. Yeah. Okay, because sometimes with a really long lens, they recommend you know it. It's hard to hold it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I try to always shoot at a, a shutter speed of about one five hundredth of a second. Okay. Uh, that's something you do in nature photography too, especially like with birds because they move so quickly. Right. Uh, right. And so I, uh, you know, get the set the uh, f stop and uh, push the ISO. Uh, to try to get to a, a fast shutter speed. And then also the lens has uh, motion correction built into it as well. Right, right, okay. All right, and one more question. Uh, this is from Pat Haller. Um, when exterior sculptural elements are replaced at Michigan Central or the Book Tower, what materials are they using nowadays? Uh, and I think uh, what this refers to that uh, uh, both Ford at Michigan Central and Dan Gilbert at the Book Tower or redoing those buildings. Are they, do you know if they're replacing those sculptural elements? And Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the book building is actually one of the buildings in the Guardians of Detroit book. And uh, there's a, the series of 12 uh, nude women along the cornice of the, the book building, the, off, the 13 story office tower, mm -hmm. office building right next to the tower. Mm -hmm. All of those were uh, terracotta over an iron frame and the iron uh, they leaked, the seams in the terracotta leaked and the iron rusted and expanded. And none of those figures could be saved. Uh, although, you know, and, and restored. I think they have one of them in the lobby of the building though. Uh, they were all replaced with fiberglass, fiberglass mm. reconstructions. Okay. So, um, if you look at them up close, you can kind of tell, uh, but I defy anyone to be able to tell from ground level and uh, hopefully they'll last a long time. Good. Well, Jeff, where can people buy your book? Uh, you can buy my book at the Guardians of Detroit website, guardiansofdetroit.com. On the homepage, there's a button to buy now. It's also, uh, uh, you can get it at Amazon or the Wayne State University Press uh, website. Uh, let me just show you too. There is also a Guardians of Detroit coloring book, uh, kind of a companion to the, the Guardians of Detroit book. Here's um, one of the images from the Detroit Free Press building. And uh, there's a, a pretty wide range of images in the book. Uh, some are more what you would call adult coloring images, more complex. And then there's also uh, simpler ones that I think kids would enjoy coloring. Okay. So that is also available on the website. Okay, very good. Um, and you're available to do this sort of thing for other groups if they want to contact you. Yeah, I have, um, I, this was a, a very specialized presentation tailored just for the Albert Kahn Foundation. Uh, I have a 45 minute uh, or an hour to a, a 60 to 90 minute presentation that I do um, with a pretty good cross section of uh, buildings from the Guardians of Detroit book. And I present it at a lot of different libraries and clubs uh, around the Detroit area. So you can contact me, anyone that's interested, uh, guardiansofdetroit.com. There's a, a page there to contact me or um, guardiansofdetroit at gmail.com. Okay, very good. Well, Jeff, it's been a pleasure having you on this evening. Um, 
the Albert Kahn Legacy Foundation and all of our viewers, uh, thank you for your, for your efforts. So thanks very much. Everybody, uh, they'll watch the website, our website, um, albertconlegacy.org. Uh, remember the silent auction um, is still up, uh, check, check it out. You can uh, 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 bid until eight o'clock tomorrow evening and watch our website for uh, announcements of few, uh, future lectures and other activities that we'll be presenting. And with that, once again, Jeff Morrison, thanks so much. Uh, thank you all for attending and have a great rest of the evening. Good night. Thank you, John, and thank you um, to the foundation. Mm -hmm.